There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This passage from 1 John, for us it acts as like, a, it's like an anchor. It's an anchor that we can cling to that reminds us of what's at the core of our life, of our faith, of you know, this reminder of what's at the center of the gospel. It's that we have been the recipients of amazing love. How can our response not be to extend this kind of love to other people? And that's, and that's what we're trying to do here. That's what we want people here in Ethiopia to know this love also, this love that we've gotten. And it's the love of Jesus and the way it motivates us is more powerful than any fears that, that become the obstacles that stand in our way. Because there, the reality is, if we're honest, there are days here when Emily and I question whether or not we're doing the right thing because it gets hard because, because our, it's hard on our family. We miss our family because we get frustrated with the, with the bureaucracy of dealing with the government. There's all kinds of things that make this, that make living here more difficult than life would be back in the U.S., you know? So in 2013, when we moved here with a nine-week-old, the reality was a lot different than what I had imagined. And I had anxieties and fears that I never thought I would have. Lock factory store. Yes, I know. Jesus is love and perfect love casts out fear. And that's something I have to always be praying for more understanding and more, more of that reality in my life. But, but my reality is I'm home all day with two babies and Travis is off doing the ministry that we came here to do. Um, and sometimes I lose sight of the purpose because I'm not outside the home. I'm not seeing it um, on a daily basis. But every once in a while, I get in the car with Travis and travel an hour down the road to Mojo, um, one of our villages where we have a church. and. I like to see the church there. I like to see the solar charging cell phone station that Travis is helping maintain because it helps me remember that we're here to help this church be self-sustaining and it's worth it. It's worth us being here. There are people in Ethiopia who have never heard about Jesus and they don't know the love of Jesus yet and we want them to have that. And so Emily and I are here in Ethiopia. We, we work primarily with Ethiopian pastors to train them so that they can go out and be evangelists in their own communities and, and to go into areas of Ethiopia where people have literally never heard about Jesus. Because the message of the gospel is love. And these are folks who generally live in fear, fear of spirits in the trees, fear of spirits, their ancestors. And when the gospel comes in, they hear a new message. They hear about a, a new way to live, a new orientation. And it's, it's a better story to be a part of for them than what, than what they were living with before. I've known Travis and Emily around two years ago. We learned from him not only from his verbal things, but also from his actions. Are we paying attention? Are we listening to God? Are we listening to God's instructions for how we are to be serving? Because some of us need to wake up. We have knowledge of something special. We have to remember the power of the knowledge we have because it has the potential to change the world, but it doesn't work unless we make ourselves available to what God is gonna do through us. Those are sons and daughters of Compassion Christian who are serving the Lord half a world away, uh, making a difference that you make possible. You make it possible because of your generosity. Your generosity is the fuel 
that drives that ministry to a certain extent. And it's, it's an awesome thing, friends. When we get to heaven, we're going to be talking about this, how we lived in Savannah. And yet our, our love, our generosity impacted the entire world. Uh, I've got a friend that's going to communicate with us uh, today about that very dynamic. And I'm, I'm so excited to introduce Dick Alexander. Dick has been like a hero for me. Uh, he's been a mentor for me. Uh, he's been one of those guys that, uh, you know, is such a brilliant strategic thinker about ministry and loves the Lord with such passion and teaches the word in, in such a powerful way. Uh, man, I've been watching him and learning from him for the last 30 years of my life. Uh, man, he is just a, a great leader. He served 29 years at LifeBridge Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, had an amazing ministry there. Uh, when he transitioned from that ministry, he became an international consultant with Christian Missionary Fellowship, which is the organization that Travis and Emily are partnering with in Ethiopia. Uh, Dick literally is one of these guys who has had a great marriage, raised a great family, led a great church, has a great impact on a global scale, and he is here by God's grace to teach us today about the impact we can have for Christ around the world. Please Welcome and give a warm, compassionate Christian welcome to our friend, Dick Alexander, as he comes to teach here today. I love you, buddy. Love you, pal. Well, it is a wonderful privilege to be back here with this church again. I think the first time that I connected with Compassion Christian Church, it was well back in the last century. There was one location. I think there were about 800 people then. Now the church has locations, it looks like, all over Georgia. At this rate, there will soon be more Compassion Christian Church locations than Starbucks in Georgia. <laughs> and I would say that's a good thing. And there are online folks tuning in, probably in South America, Africa, Asia today. So wherever you are, as you're part of this experience with us today, we're really glad that you're here because this is an important day. For those of you I haven't met before, I should probably say I am the guy with the weird voice. <clears throat> we had new uh, neighbors move in next door last year. They have four sons. <clears throat> They're at seven, five, four, and two. So Betty and I went over to introduce ourselves to him. The boys were standing with their father out in the yard. I said a few sentences about who we were, and the five-year-old William looks up and says, Dad, it's Batman. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to be with you today. A number of years ago, I was doing student ministry in Southern California. One of the things that we enjoyed doing was taking groups <clears throat> from Orange County suburbia to the wilderness. So we would backpack in the high Sierras, we'd rock climb, we'd go canoeing. I had a group of, a large group of high school students who were going canoeing. We were gonna do some rough white water, like think deliverance. But first we had to train on some smooth flat water. <clears throat> so we were on the Sacramento River in Central California. First morning we put in and the goal that day was for everybody just to be able to steer their canoes straight, make it go where they wanted it to go. We hadn't been on the river long. We came around to bend, and they were building a new bridge across the river. So there were pilings down where the bridge was being built, and they had actually filled in most of the river so that the whole channel flowed through one faster-moving chute down the middle. I wasn't too worried about that because if you just sit still in your canoe, the water flow would carry the kids down that channel except that we were doing a lab experiment on Murphy's Law that day, and Murphy won. Uh, we wrapped two canoes around bridge pilings and made the front page of the Red Bluff Daily News near catastrophe strikes church group. Nobody was hurt in it because their canoes just tipped over, students flushed down through. We gathered up them, gathered up their equipment, spread it out over the other canoes, headed on down the river. That night, uh, we got to our destination a little bit late. We were camping on the riverbank. By the time we got dinner ready, it was almost midnight, and it wasn't quite dinner time when one of the adult leaders came over and said, Dick, um, there's a group of girls over there I think you need to talk to. So I went over there, about a half dozen girls, maybe sophomore in high school age, sitting on a ground cloth. I sat down with them and said, 
hey, how you doing? One of the girls spoke up and she would always speak up. Her name was Debbie. And she said, we want you to do something about this. And I asked, well, what do you have in mind? She said, we want you to get us out of here. Well, this was perfect because the reason we did these trips was to stretch people, to stretch them beyond their normal coping mechanisms and then help them dig deeper and develop a meaningful faith with God that would get them through the difficulties. And it was a pitch black night. So I said, Debbie, there are three ways to get out of here. Number one, see the woods over there. You can hike out through the woods. It's seven miles to the highway and hitchhike home. It's about 400 miles. Number two, you can take your sleeping bag down to the river and get it wet. Use it like an Indian blanket on the fire. Send up smoke signals. Hope your mother sees them and flies in a Coast Guard helicopter to fly you out. Number three, you can get back in your canoe in the morning and head down the river. She said, well, what if I get hurt? And I said, what if you do? You'll heal up, you'll be fine. She said, well, what if I die? And I said, what if you do? You'll go to heaven and that's what we're all waiting for, isn't it? She said, no. <laughs> now, what you need to know about Debbie was, <clears throat> she was a church kid. Debbie was a kid who grew up in Sunday school. She was the kid that Sunday school teachers love. She memorized every Bible verse. She had a Bible full of stickers from all the awards she won in Sunday school. But when she was backed against the wall, she didn't have a faith that would get her through a difficulty, through a challenge. She had a lot more in her head than in her heart. And what I would suggest to you is that there's a little bit of Debbie in a lot of us. So if you've been around church for a while, there's a pretty good chance that you have more in your head than your heart. Adult Christians in America keep going to Bible studies. Friends, our problem is not a lack of knowledge, it's a lack of obedience. We already know more than what we're doing. We haven't let Jesus Christ consume us and then therefore give us a faith that's really meaningful and a love of God that changes everything. Now, our scripture text this morning is from 1 John 4, 18 to 21. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles with me to that passage of scripture and refer back to it as we go through this message. This was written by the apostle John. He was called an apostle of love. That's surprising because when Jesus first met him, he called him a son of thunder. So here was a man who went from being a bad-tempered guy to a man whose life was so filled with love that he wrote a letter to the church like this one from which we're about to read. We want to begin in verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, did you catch how that began in verse 18? So there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. <clears throat> when I was growing up, I got a lot of spankings. I was a bad kid. I deserved every spanking I got. I deserved more spankings than I got. But my mother had one sentence that could put the fear of God in me in an instant. It was, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> because for misdemeanors, mom took care of that. She had a little wooden paddle she spanked me with. It wasn't all that bad. And dad took care of the felonies. And dad spanked with a belt. I didn't get many spankings from my dad because I didn't need many. I just lived in fear of that. When I grew up and became an adult, I no longer feared 
my father. Now there's some Christians who came to Christ because you didn't want to go to hell. Nobody wants to be a crispy critter. That was a good choice that you made. But if you still fear God, your love is incomplete. He doesn't want a relationship with you that's based on fear or guilt. This passage says, love casts out fear. When there's fear, our love is still incomplete. And the word cast out there is a word for cast out demons. It's just to get that stuff out of here so that our lives are filled with and consumed by love. Love for God and love for the people God loves. Verse 19 is priceless. We love because he first loved us. That is solid gold. A couple years ago, Betty and I were vacationing in Canada and Northern Ontario. It's a place we often go. It's about 600 miles from our home in Cincinnati. Usually when we're driving home, we're driving in one day. That year we decided to make it a two day drive. So we stopped about halfway home in Southern Ontario. We got a motel in a small town. It was a Saturday night. We wanted to worship on Sunday morning before we got back on the road. So I got on the internet at our motel and I was looking for a church and I was in consumer church mode. I was looking for one that looked interesting where the service wouldn't be too long. I didn't want it to start too early because we were on vacation, but I didn't want it to run too late because we wanted to get on the road. So we found a church and that seemed to fit that. We showed up there. We slid in the back road just before the service started. Our plan was at the last day, man, we're out of here. We're not talking to anybody. We were the church visitors from hell. So they started worship. First song was some strange Canadian song I'd never heard before. The second song is one I know well and that you may know. It's This Is Amazing Grace. And it is a song about what God has done for us and his love for us. The chorus says, you laid down your life that I may be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all you've done for me. And then in the second verse, there are a couple lines that go like this. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? As we sang that verse, the tears just poured down my face. And that's happened other times when we've sung that song because that is my story, the orphan who became a son. I was abandoned at birth. My birth mother was married. Her husband was off fighting in the Pacific Theater during World War II. While he was gone, she had an affair and I was the product of that affair. He came home, found her eight months pregnant with another man's baby, said so he didn't want anything to do with somebody else's baby. So when it came time for the delivery, she checked into the hospital, a very scared young woman. She checked in under an assumed name, Evans, and gave me that name. I was David Evans for the first year of my life. And when it was time for her to leave the hospital, when she was well enough, she slipped out of the hospital and left me there. I was in foster care the first year of my life. And then as I was about to be sent to an orphanage, the doctor who delivered me approached the couple who eventually adopted me to take me into their home. They were a church-going family. They took me to a wonderful church, salt to the earth people, where I grew up learning about a heavenly father who never abandons his children. The orphan who became a son is my story. And if you are a Christ follower, you have a story. More importantly, you are a story. You are a story of God's love. If you haven't yet given your life to Christ, you can this day become a story of God's love. And this scripture says, we love because he first loved us. And that means we love God and we love the people God loves. And verse 20 says, if you love, you can't hate. It also is very blunt. It says, if you don't love others, you don't love God. 
Verse 21 says, if you love God, you must love others. Now, this is a passage of scripture. It's a letter that was written to the church. So it's primarily about relationships within the body of Christ. But there's an implicit underlying principle in this. If you love God, you must love those God loves. So I'm going to summarize this passage this way. Because God first loved us, we fearlessly love God and the people God loves. Now, this is Faith Promise Sunday. We're here to talk about missions today, global mission. What does this passage of scripture have to do with missions? Simple. Missions is scary. It is scary to go. It can be scary to give. But this is a scripture that says, love casts out fear. God cares about this whole world. The world we live in is a very harsh place today. <clears throat> One of our get <clears throat> guests here today is Jenny Sinny from Ukraine, Compassion Christian. And the church I served in Cincinnati partnered for a number of years in ministry in Ukraine. It was an absolutely wonderful experience. I think we received more than we gave <clears throat> from the deep faith of the Ukrainian Christians. They live in a very difficult circumstance now. In the last few years, Russia has bitten off two chunks of Ukraine, and it threatens to take the whole country. <clears throat> the geopolitical fear <clears throat> in Ukraine is very real. Many people in the world live in extreme poverty. Three billion people live on $2.50 a day or less. They fear <clears throat> not having food for their family tomorrow. Spiritual poverty is real. In India, people live in fear of evil spirits. <clears throat> it's built into the architecture of their houses. If you walk into the front door of an Indian home, you don't walk into a room. You walk into a hallway that goes straight out a door in the back. That's so if an evil spirit comes in the front door, it doesn't get trapped in the house. It just goes through and out the back door. <clears throat> this is a world that lives in fear, but God wants it to be free from fear. What keeps that from happening? In part, it's our fears. It's our fears because missions is scary and we hold back on going and we hold back on giving because there's a little bit of Debbie in all of us. This church does an absolutely incredible ministry of providing opportunities for people to go serve overseas short term. Now, I know there are folks who, for whom just getting on a plane to go across the ocean is scary. You think, maybe if there was a mission trip to a Caribbean island, I could do a little beach evangelism. <clears throat> Most mission work uh, isn't done in places like that. It's in places that may be a little different and a little more scary. Cam and I were traveling in Bosnia together <clears throat> a few years ago. It was after the end of the Bosnian War. We were looking at what God might do in that country. So we were staying in a little guest house one night. Cam got a hankering for ice cream. And he walked across the street to his store and got some ice cream, which was a tragic mistake that he paid for the entire next day. Uh, he didn't go more than a few feet from the bathroom in the hotel that day. Mission trips can be like that. There are things that happen. But tomorrow night at the Henderson campus, there is a global encounter where you can see many opportunities for you to go and serve short term. And I would say, don't let Debbie keep you from coming. See how God could use your life. Long term mission work can be much more intimidating. Last year, I heard a couple interviewed who are missionaries in Afghanistan. When they were introduced to us, their last names weren't given because it would be dangerous for them to be known as missionaries. So just their first names are given. They're uh, working there with non-government organizations, helping rebuild a war-torn country. They told their stories, fascinating. They said after several years there, their Afghan coworkers began quietly coming to them one at a time. And they would say things like, you're an American. 
Are you a Christian? Can you tell me about Jesus? And they do. And one by one, their Afghan co-workers are coming to Christ. Near the end of the interview, they were asked a typical question. What's the hardest thing for you being there? Usually Americans will say, oh, the heat, it's awful, or I miss pizza. They took, they took the question seriously. They reflected for a moment, and then the, the man said, seeing our Afghan friends die, seeing them killed by the Taliban for any reason or no reason. But I will assure you of this, when they finished that interview and we walked out of the room, there wasn't a single person feeling sorry for them. They are living the richest possible lives, lives that count. So I wanna encourage you to go where God calls you, to love God and the people God loves, and to pray that your children will go, that God will use them wherever he wants to in the world. And there's one other thing, and it's a critical thing we wanna talk about this morning, and that is the giving part of world mission. American dollars make a huge dent overseas. The organization I work for partners with an African-led and run mission organization, Mission of Hope International, works with people who are in extreme poverty in Africa. And their strategy is simple. They start schools. They invite children at age three into their schools because that's the age at which kids are typically sent out to beg. They give them two meals a day, six days a week, and an absolutely great education. And through those children then, they're able to connect with their families. 40% of the families are HIV positive. They test them, they get them on medication, they train them for jobs. The schools have just phenomenal results. They built a new school building for one of their 17 schools. This last year, it cost $600,000 to build. On the one hand, that sounds like a lot of money. In Cincinnati, where I live, the school district next to us just completed a new building for $42 million. That school district is failing. It is one of the lowest rated in the entire state of Ohio, a $42 million building. A phenomenal school in Africa was $600,000, 1.5% of the cost. Two of the early graduates from the mission schools are now in North America studying. One of them is working on a degree in engineering at the University of Toronto on a full scholarship. Another is at Stanford University working on an MBA on a full scholarship. 1.5% of the cost to build those schools. See, American dollars make a huge difference. Today, you have the opportunity to invest. And I want to encourage you not to be afraid as you do that. We'll take risks for ourselves. A few years ago, my family for my birthday gave me a certificate to go skydiving. Now, if you ever receive one of those, you think about it a little bit. <laughs> Most guys get golf shirts for their birthdays. My family sent me out to jump out of an airplane. <laughs> and they went along with me to watch it happen. So I was in the jump school and they're just laughing their way through this as I get instructions. Just before we head to the plane, they hand me a, a release of liability to sign. It said, I acknowledge that I understand that one out of every 20,000 jumps ends in death. And you think, how long has it been since the last, where are we? <laughs> 19,800, 19,900. Just then a guy walked by in a t-shirt that said, if at first you don't succeed, skydiving isn't for you. <laughs> Actually, it was really fun. A little scary, but fun. We will do things that are scary for fun, and we'll do things that are scary for ourselves. Do you own a home? 
when you signed your first contract for a house, what was that like for you? If you were like me, your hand was shaking. I thought, I am signing the rest of my life away. But I was willing to do that for myself and my family. So this morning at the end of this service, as you commit, why would you not commit more? What, what do you fear? Is it a loss of status from driving your car a couple years longer so that you can free up resources to make a difference in the world? Are you afraid you'll miss out on some fun? Are you afraid you won't be able to pay bills? Because God first loved us, we fearlessly love God and the people God loves. A couple years ago, I was in Kenya, and I just mentioned the mission that we partner with there. It was started by a Kenyan woman who was one of 20 children. Her father was a polygamist. She got through school, managed to go to university, became a Christian in university, started volunteering in this massive slum in Nairobi. Since then, that mission has branched out now to some other poor places in Kenya. So I flew with her and a couple others across country to a desert area where a tribe named the Turkana live. They live in grass huts in the desert. they are camels walking around. When you're there, you just look around. It seems so surreal. It's the Africa you studied about in school. The Christian mission had been asked to take over two government schools. The government said, we're not good at educating poor students. You know how. So we were going to visit those schools. We flew on a little twin engine and propeller commercial plane, landed in a town called Lodwar. The landing strip is about as long as your driveway. We touched down, the pilot slammed on the brakes. He pulled over to the airport building. It's about as big as your garage. They didn't even shut off the engines. <clears throat> they set our suitcases out in the dirt. That was baggage claim. We were, we were picked up by a UN vehicle that drove us out across the desert. No road, just tire tracks. I'm praying, Lord, don't let a strong wind come up or we'll never find our way back to town. We went out to the government school. <clears throat> it was one of the saddest experiences ever. First three grades, no desks, no chairs. Students sat on the floor. Government couldn't afford furniture for the school. Very few girls in school. In the eighth grade, there was one girl. After we toured the school, we met with a headmaster. For an hour and a half, he laid out a list of needs, basic stuff, just curriculum, and they needed all of that. So we were on our way back to town, and I asked Mary, the mission director, why was there only one girl in the eighth grade? She said, the rest are married. Their fathers begin marrying them off when they're seven. They marry them to men who are 40 or 50 years old, who already have two or three wives. They can get a good dowry. A man can get 40 goats for a good young seven-year-old daughter. That afternoon, we went to the mission school. The mission strategy is recruit students in when they're three years old. And then in that tribal area, as the girls start going home from school in their uniforms, the social workers and the pastors accompany them. And they talk with the parents, they talk with the fathers. They explain to them what it can mean for their daughters to get an education, to grow up, and what it can mean for their whole family if they let their daughters stay in school and get an education. That afternoon, we arrived at the mission school in that desert. It was way over 100 degrees. It was Thursday afternoon. We got there at about 4 o'clock. Teachers have been teaching all week, students in school all week. They were all sitting out under a big tree waiting for us. 800 students <clears throat> up through fifth grade. Every year, the school's adding a grade. When we arrived, they came alive. They put on an hour and a half program for us. The last half hour of it was the fifth grade music group that a couple of weeks later placed third in the nation in a national competition 
for a half hour, those kids recited scripture songs and sang the songs of Jesus in five languages. And those are the kids from the grass huts. Now that's what American mission support makes possible. Missionaries are doing things like that around the world. This church has great global partners from Greece to Ghana, from Poland to Pakistan, from Ecuador to Ethiopia. The mission partners of Compassion Christian Church serve today. Your partners are rescuing children, visiting clin prisons, uh, running clinics, starting schools, teaching the gospel, starting churches, training leaders. And if you're a Christian, you've experienced the love of God. If you're a Christ follower, you not only have a story, you are a story. So this morning there'll be an opportunity in a very tangible way to express love for those God loves. I wanna ask you very simply, last week you were asked to pray about this over the week. And some of you probably had two numbers. You prayed about a lower number and a higher number. I wanna ask you very simply, if that was you, take the higher number today. And you may have prayed about it and just very easily come to what you want to commit today. I wanna to make a bold ask. Would you take it up a notch? Would you do that because of God's love for you? And you may have come in here today not realizing what was going on. And you walked in the door and realized, oh no, it's Mission Sunday. They're gonna ask me for money today. Well, yes. And I, if that's you, I want to ask you to surprise yourself today, to make a commitment larger than you thought you could. A commitment big enough that in the car on the way home, you'll think, did I really do that? But see, this matters. This is really important. Lives are at stake. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we had nothing to bring to you. Nothing but a broken life. And you took us and loved us and made us your children. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so very much. And we pray, Lord, that you will free us from fear May the love of Christ be shed abroad in our hearts this day for the sake of Christ and the world. Amen.